So welcome everybody. My name is Jacob Sondergaard. I will be your host today. I'm one of the account managers at Head Acoustics and I am on the east coast of the United States. So it's just past two o'clock here, but I'm happy to see all of you dial in from all over North America and abroad as well. Today's topic in the Head Acoustics educational a webinar series is about speech intelligibility, speech transmission, and we will even dip our toes into speech quality because there is a connection there that we find relevant to share in today's session. The agenda is pretty straightforward. We'll talk a lot about speech intelligibility, how we go about measuring the different metrics we have available to maybe gauge what the intelligibility will be in different environments and for different devices. We'll talk about things like audibility, uh, usability. We'll talk about noise, how that influences it, as well as reverberation. And uh, I will be sharing different uh, applications as well. As I mentioned, we'll touch on speech quality because there is a link there that we find important. And we'll build up towards some of the later topics that we will cover. The first thing I want to share is a quick picture of where noise lives. Because when we talk about intelligibility, we rarely talk about intelligibility for a, I guess what we would call an ideal acoustic scenario with no background noise. There will always be some level of background noise involved when we talk about uh, trying to measure for intelligibility. And as you can see, and as you know, as you are aware, we are constantly surrounded by different types of machinery or natural occurrences that generate noise that could influence how we perceive things and how intelligible speech would be. With that said, let's take a look at the boundaries of human hearing because that's pretty much the entire graph here from about 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz on the frequency aspect and on the magnitude side of things, we go from about 0 dB SPL all the way to 140 dB SPL. Now, that's obviously the extremes. You can see that in the middle of that rectangle, there is a blob called music. That's usually where the spectrum of music is found. And then within that, there's an even smaller blob of speech. It's roughly about 150 hertz to some around 8K typically is where most speech energy is found and it's usually found at very reasonable SPL limits. Now with that being said, I want to plant a seed in your brain here uh, about a, a way to think about speech and intelligibility. What I have displayed for you here is a clean speech signal which is the utterance, the hogs, were fed chopped corn and garbage. I think you are familiar with that utterance from your work in telecommunications. Unfortunately, I can't play that utterance for you today, but if you were to, I think this analogy works very well if we just examine it visually. So you look at the time domain representation of that signal and it looks very much like a landscape. We have peaks and valleys due to the high crest factor of our signal. We have good frequency modulation as well with some good high frequency and low frequency content. And it's just like looking at the window and seeing a beautiful alpine landscape. Right? You have Lake Geneva somewhere in the middle. You have Mount Everest and some of the little alpine villages dotted along the edges. That's what I would like for you to imagine those speech signals are. Now, if we start to add noise to a speech signal, what we can imagine is these little lakes and rivers are starting to overflow and start to drown out some of the very low levels. So if I were to play the file for you now, the, the hogs were fed chopped corn and garbage. What you might not be able to hear are some of those finer details at the very low levels in that utterance that doesn't come through anymore or it's not as audible anymore. You can still detect the higher amplitude, sort of the peaks and the mountains of our landscape, but a lot of the low level stuff has been submerged and is muddied and drowned out. That is the equivalent of noise 
to intelligibility. Now for reverb, what I would like to draw a parallel to is when it snows. So I'm in the northern states, and yesterday I looked out the window in April and saw snow, much to my dismay. But what snow tends to do is if you look at the branches and the leaves on the trees and bushes or even the individual blades of grass, what snow does is it really covers it, smooths out all high frequency detail. You don't see individual blades of grass, you just see a white blanket. And reverb has a similar effect to uh, intelligibility as snow does on a landscape in that it really smooths out a lot of the high frequency, frequency stuff. It makes it not as intelligible and not as audible. So once again, if we could play it, you would be able to hear the same sentence. You'd be able to make sense of it. The hogs were fed chopped corn and garbage. But with the added reverb, obviously I can't reproduce that myself, but imagine you step into a church or a cathedral or something, very high reverb, and you know that when you have to communicate in an environment like that, all the low frequency energy tends to bounce around quite a lot. You tend to have to slow down your speech significantly. And a lot of the high frequency stuff just doesn't make it through as clearly. So that's a little bit of the analogy I want to impart with you. Now, if we take a 30,000 foot overview of the different metrics we have available, and we'll dive into some of them here today, the first one, sort of the big one to get standardized in the 1960s was AI, not artificial intelligence, but the articulation index. And the articulation index was really born out of, in part, the hearing health industries of audiology and, and hearing aids and hearing protection devices, that domain, as well as industrial acoustics. And that was used for a very long time. In Before AI really evolved into SII, sort of in the same audiology branch of acoustics, the Speech Intelligibility Index, you can see a couple of others showed up. PSIL, we'll touch on that today, which is the preferred speech interference level. STI showed up out of the Speech and Telecom branch of acoustics, the one that we primarily operate in. And then somewhere along the line, you can see Speech and Telecom started adopting some of these other metrics. But then there was a break in the timeline, right around the change in the uh, the millennium, around the year 2000, where maybe because we've gotten so good at making communication products, but we shifted our focus away from evaluating speech intelligibility to focusing a lot more on speech quality, which is why you start to see metrics like PESC, and Tosca, then about a decade later you have Polka, and then EQuest, FreeQuest, and so on have shown up. You can see even in the hearing aid industry, a similar trend has happened where they've moved away from AI and SII, not completely, but have also started adopting metrics like HASCII, the Hearing Aid Speech Quality Index, which is a speech quality index specifically targeted towards evaluating quality for people with hearing impairments. It's quite an interesting metric, but not really something we use in speech and telecom in general. So let's take a look at articulation index. This was really the first big stab at getting uh, some idea of how good would human speech be in a particular environment. It's a very simple metric dates back to the 60s, but hey, it was a start. It's not really used very much anymore. And when we go into the details on the next couple of slides, I think you'll get a sense of why it's not used anymore. But the fundamental idea is you measure whatever background noise environment you're in or whatever residual noise is left behind from a noise suppressor, echo cancer, something else. And you apply some weighting curves and compare to some generalized speech values to get an articulation index number. Now, it can be used for any noise environment of your choosing. Go out, take your reference uh, microphone, reference grade microphone, sound level meter, and capture a noise spectrum. 
It could be for a lot of our customers. They work in the automotive space. It could be inside the cabin of a car. So if you're going 80 miles an hour, you know instinctively what that feels like, what that sounds like. There's a lot of rumbling and, and, and humming noises, low frequency dominated. If you look at the spectrum on the right-hand side, you can see what that looks like from an FFT perspective. Now, in ANSI S3.5, dating back to 1969, you'll be able to find a lot of these details, but the fundamental aspect, we'll work through it here, the process of capturing the articulation index is you measure your background noise, and then you have this idealized speech spectrum in our handy dandy spreadsheet. You can literally do this calculation in a spreadsheet tells you what the idealized levels are. You do a comparison or subtraction rather in the third octave bands between 200 hertz and five kilohertz, so roughly where the majority of speech is found. And then there is a weighting factor to be uh, applied that gives you the individual articulation index numbers that you sum up for one number. You can see in this case, for our driving scenario, we end up with an articulation index of basically 0.5. Now, the cool thing about AI is we get one number. The bad thing is that number is A, just a single number. It doesn't really tell us about the individual noise scenarios, nor does it really tell us much about how to translate that into the human intelligibility or the human perception of speech because while we are doing an idealized speech spectrum as a reference that we compare up against, we're not really balancing and looking at the individual frequency components. We're really just doing an SNR based evaluation of speech and noise and it's in a limited bandwidth. So for our driving scenario, in a full-size car going 80 miles an hour, here's a 30-second time file. So imagine yourself driving 80 miles an hour down the road. You hit a little bump. There's a little bit of noise, tire noise, rumbling. And if we apply the articulation index versus time, you'd get something like this with an overall articulation index of 61%. Now. You're in your car, you're driving 81 miles an hour, and I say, your articulation index is 61%. Do you agree with that? Uh, that's, a, <laughs> that's a difficult thing to respond to because we don't, we're not really sure what 61% means, but I guess in a nice full-size car, sure, there's, there's a decent amount of sound dampening taking place in the vehicle. It might have active noise cancellation. It shouldn't be that tremendously loud, and you should be relatively audible, but uh, there's no real framework or reference for that 61% that makes it easy for us to understand or apply. Now, PSIL, the preferred speech interference level, is the, the offshoot of articulation index that in the early 70s was created primarily to speed things up. So, the bottom line with PCL is instead of using the third octave bands from 200 hertz to 5K, we now use only the octave band values from 200 hertz to 4K. So basically four octaves worth of data to provide as a pretty good indicator of the ability of noise to potentially impair speech. Now, we sit here in 2018 and think, What's the difference between calculating a couple of octave bands or a couple of third octave bands? But of course, back in the 60s and 70s, in real time, that was pretty difficult. So PSIL was you know, leaps and bounds better. We could very quickly get an idea of what's going on in this noise environment. Just like AI, it can be used for any type of noise environment. But this time, we don't even compare to any form of speech. We just look at the noise signature. So for reference material, you can look up ANSI S3.14. And if we look at the process, the first thing we do is we measure our background noise. And you can see in our spreadsheet on the right-hand side, we have the octave bands, four of them, that we sum up for a single PCL number. 
And the second step is we refer to a lookup table where we say our P cell was 43.4, that's roughly 45. Well, given that amount of speech interference level, what we end up with is a conversation at normal speaking level is roughly intelligible and decently intelligible up to 2.3 meters away. However, if you raise your voice, you might be able to double that distance and go 4.6 meters. So roughly about 8 feet to somewhere between up to 16 feet. That's what the P-cell number tells us. From a practical standpoint, now you can see the P-cell number would give us an idea that if you're driving 80 miles an hour, or rather, let's say you're in the passenger seat going 80 miles an hour and somebody else is driving the car, because if you turn your head around and you look all the way to the back of your vehicle, you're driving a big SUV or a minivan with a third row, you probably have to raise your voice a little bit to make yourself decently intelligible all the way in the back row. I don't know if that's entirely eight feet away, but it might be pretty close. And so you can see with PCIL and the lookup table, uh, okay, at least we start to get some idea of where this makes sense and how this would slot into the real world. But fundamentally, we're still just looking at capturing the background noise. So now let's jump up 30 years or so to the mid to late 90s where the speech intelligibility index was standardized. This is really the true successor to articulation index. And now we use both speech and noise in our evaluation. So SII, similar to AI, is rated on a scale from zero to one or zero to 100 percent and depends on both the spectrum of the speech as well as the noise. Now, what speech intelligibility index fundamentally is, is a measure of the percentage of cues that are audible. And I guess just as importantly, what I would like to mention is what speech intelligibility index is not. It is not equal to speech intelligibility or human perception of speech. So if you score something like 50% speech intelligibility index, it actually means that you get probably a much higher human perception or intelligibility of speech. Now, why does this algorithm matter? Because you can now use your own real speech to compare in the algorithm, not just some standardized speech, which you can find in the ANSI standard. Once again, you can apply this to any noise environment. For instance, crossroads. So if you look up NCS 3.5 from 1997, you can get all the background material for this. But again, the procedure here is let's measure our background noise spectrum. And then I want to make this point clear in a separate quiet room away from your noise, you measure your speech spectrum. Once you have your clean speech and once you have your noise, you can choose which bands are of interest to you in your calculation octave bands, third octave bands, or for those of you that are psychoacoustically inclined, the th critical bands. And then you look at the differences between the speech and the disturbance. Well, not just the noise, because disturbance also includes some of the self-masking effects of speech. So this is taking a step beyond just doing SNR style comparison. There's actually an element of psychoacoustics here and how there are masking effects. Then we weigh, uh, we weight each band and then sum it up for a final speech intelligibility index number between 0 and 1. So as I mentioned, the index doesn't equate to intelligibility. In the top right-hand corner, what you'll see here is a chart, and I, I believe it comes from one of Mead Killian's articles. Mead is a very famous uh, uh, acoustician in the hearing health industry, I think long-time edemotic. Uh, maybe he's the founder, but in any case, he wrote a paper several years ago that had this translation for the SII value on the x-axis to the correct identification or understanding by a human being on the y-axis. And you can see that if you are only interested in 
recognizing digits. So 13, 52, 6, 8, basically counting. You don't actually need a particularly high speech intelligibility index. If you exceed about 15%, you should actually get a very high correct identification and understanding and perception of those digits in that environment by a human listener. So that's obviously very encouraging for those people that are interested in that. And you immediately, the, the first thought that comes to mind will be things like military applications, GPS coordinates, transmission, and, you know, theater of war, it's noisy, they need to transmit this information, and they need to be understood, both transmitted uh, over radio and RF, but also face-to-face. -face. That's the good thing. Now, if you get a little bit more sophisticated, and you want to look at full sentences or IEEE words within a sentence, you preferably should aim for slightly higher speech intelligibility index. It's a little bit more difficult, but still, you can see if you hover around a 50% mark SII, in general, you're still scoring very high in terms of the human intelligibility perception ability. The reason why is the human brain has that fantastic ability to interpolate, fill in the gaps, use context, things of that nature, where we don't necessarily need every single syllable or sound in a word or every word in a sentence or every sentence in a conversation to figure out what message is being transmitted. And so in general, our recommendations are on the order of if you hit 75% when you evaluate your noise field relative to your speech spectrum, you would be considered safe. Right? That's, that's a good number to hit. Anything less than 45% is really poor. The different curves here, the red one, the NU6 words, the, I think that's the Northwestern University. They have some different words here that are usually the tricky words. They're very hard to identify. They may have uh, double meanings or have words that sound very similar to them. So there are words like uh, pool, like swimming pool, uh, take, or third, or death, or uh, knock as in knocking on a door. Some of those words can be very hard to identify, and especially once you start to add a little bit of noise to the environment. And that's where uh, Mead, Killian, and his group found out that the intelligibility index in that case needs to be a fair deal higher before you reach, let's say, the 90th percentile correctness in understanding. So keep that in mind. Another place where we see speech intelligibility index come into play is the evaluation of residual noise. So let's first look at this crossroad example. The crossroad time file is shown on screen. It's 30 seconds long. You're standing at the side of the road and there's a car that goes by roughly around the five second mark. Then there's a big bus changing gears and kicking in somewhere around the 15 second mark and then just general traffic noise in the background. If you're standing there and we run the speech intelligibility index on this noise signature and compare it to standard speech with a normal speaking volume and place the listener and the talker one meter apart, our SII score overall is about 12%. That's obviously very poor. And you think about that situation if you're standing at the side of a road in a densely populated urban area, i.e. downtown, right, Manhattan, and you're standing there, a lot of traffic. Would that make sense? 12%? Maybe it's a little on the low side, but remember that human ability to interpolate and fill in the gaps. If somebody yells out some numbers to you, would or actually doesn't yell, uses a normal voice, would you be able to detect them? Eh, maybe with 90% confidence. Now, that may not be a completely fair assessment because we all know from our work in telecommunications that there is such a thing as the Lombard effect, right? When people are in a noisy environment, we elevate 
our speaking level to compensate for that noise, and that varies based on the noise. So if we throw the same speech intelligibility index on the same 83 dB SPL crossroad noise, you're still standing at that same intersection, but we now use, first of all, idealized speech. So those are the more crisp and uh, enunciated words. We raise the speaking level from a normal to a raised voice level. So we improve our SNR and we also minimize or uh, decrease our distance from one meter to half a meter between the talker and the listener, basically improving SNR. All of a sudden, our SI index improves to 64%. Now, if you recall our chart on the right-hand side, 64%, we have pretty good confidence here that almost anything you would say would be highly perceptible and intelligible. You might see things like those words like knock or death or third or take. They might get confused one out of five times. But overall, that's actually a pretty good score to get. And of course, if you put yourself in that position where you're standing a meter away from somebody and you want to communicate with them, there's a bus driving by, you might lean in towards that person. You might very well raise your voice. You might even slow down your speech and, and uh, make sure you pronounce and enunciate your words more carefully, i.e. using more idealized speech. So the SII index has the ability to adapt to those as well. But you can see it's the same 83 dB, uh, 83 dB SPL background noise with the same speech intelligibility index algorithm, we just changed our parameters and we went from 12% to 64%. So you just have to be careful what parameters were used in the index. Now, one other application where this is showing up uh, these days is, is evaluating the residual noise in communication systems. It, it could be in things like vehicles, where you're just interested in getting a, a quick look at how your ANC system performs in a vehicle or how much your dampening, your, your sound dampening material is improving the cabin interior. It could be things like the residual noise in ANC headphones or even in communication devices that you could use to evaluate this. And of course, it could be things like building acoustics. It could be changing the material on things like seatbacks in a vehicle or in a movie theater. Where, you could, where we could see this application of SII being appropriate. Now let's take a look at the speech transmission index because up until now, everything that we talked about, the primary goal was to capture the noise field and then if we were lucky, we could do some comparison with real speech, but never in the same scenario and never in the same environment. The measure of speech and the measure of noise were always going to be separated from each other. With STI, we start to unify it because what STI is trying to do, even though it comes from the room acoustics approach, is it actually takes into account the transmission path, whether that is acoustically through a room, through a window, through a door, down a hallway or through an electroacoustic device or a network, the transmission channel can be included in the measurement and the channel itself will have some influence on the overall speech transmission index value that we get at the end of it. So some of the things we're looking at here are speech level and background noise. So still fundamentally SNR is a part of our calculation here, just like we did previously. But there's also elements of the frequency response, the distortion, and the big thing is the echo and reverb that we could experience uh, in this measurement and how that would affect the bands that contain speech. Now, STI was typically used for communication systems, so things like PA systems. Um, the way we go about it is we use a maximum length sequence stimulus. So unfortunately, we don't use real speech, but we use a maximum length sequence slightly modified. So you can look at the frequency spectrum here and see that it generally, if you squint, 
it generally looks a little bit like average speech. Low frequency dominated rolls off the higher frequency you go, but with some different stimulating bands. The idea, if you want to look in 6268-16 IEC, is that we play a MLS signal into our environment or through our transmission channel, and then we record the same or the resulting MLS signal on the other end after it has experienced losses or introduction of noise or modulation or reverb. And then we do the calculation of the uh, individual speech bands to look for modulation and end up with a final STI value for that transmission. So one thing to note here is, again, speech transmission index does not equal intelligibility, human intelligibility. Another thing is, if you look at the dates in the IEC standard, we're starting to approach modern day. So it's something that's a little bit, a little bit more up to date. We once again use a lookup table. So where your STI values will correspond to an overall grade, someone like a MOS, similar to a, a, a MOS value, and we go from bad to excellent. And then if you look at, let's say 50% STI value, the equivalent of fair, we're also given some indication of what the human intelligibility would be of syllables within a word, so for the 50 percentile area, somewhere between 48 and 67 percent of syllables in a word would be intelligible. You can see that we then increase our intelligibility of words within a sentence even more so. And then finally, when we talk about the overall intelligibility of sentences within a conversation, we're now looking at somewhere around 95 percent. So in some ways, it lines up very well with the SII values and the graphs that were provided by Mead Killian and his team in that we don't need 100% SII or STI for that matter in order to get very good human intelligibility. But somewhere preferably above 60-70% for either of the two values is really what we should be aiming for. So as a reference, what I can share with you is in a former life, I used to do a lot of work with the uh, National Fire Protection Institute, the NFPI. They have a standard, NFPI 1981, that governs the acoustic properties for SCBAs. That's what they call self-contained breathing apparatuses, basically oxygen masks. The idea is a firefighter needs to be able to enter a building and breathe. There's a lot of smoke in there, but Another thing they need to do when they have this oxygen mask in front of their face is it obviously has to withstand shock and uh, drops and high temperatures, but it also has to be able to be acoustically transparent to some degree. And so one of the tests that they have in the NFP, uh, NFPI 1981 is a speech transmission index value where I believe it's 55% or 0.55 is the threshold for what those SCBAs have to pass when you stick a mannequin in a reverb chamber and then a reference mic, I forget if it's one or two meters, but somewhere out in front of the head and torso and then put the SCBA on the in front of the mouth of the head and torso. So their threshold is 55%, which should be uh, a minimum from a consumer standpoint, but that's just to give you a sense of this is what these guys are dealing with in that space. Now, if I could play this STI transmission for you, I would love to. This is taken just from my house. I set up the head and torso in my living room to great the great joy of my kids. And then I played out the MLS sequence and measure with a reference mic not too far away. And you can see I scored 87% STI, basically excellent. It's very, very good. If I played it for you, you would hear something like an alien shriek, right? Because it's the MLS or the modified MLS sequence that we're using as the stimulus signal. So while the STI is great because we're actually stimulating the environment we're in with a source signal, 
it's still not real speech. We still can't use our own ears and our own brain to interpret the results. And we have to rely on the algorithm and then make some assumptions. Now, clean, quiet living room, 87% or better, sure. If you were invited to my house, which if you ever come by, we can talk about it. Some of you guys I know, you wouldn't be invited. Those of you guys I don't know, sure. And you would sit in one under the room, I would sit in the other. There's nothing there to really disrupt our conversation, right? We can have a normal conversation. But if we start talking about uh, the vehicle example, driving 80 miles an hour, and you're in the front seat, I'm in the back seat, or vice versa, okay, maybe things change and the numbers start to correlate and make some sense. But we can't listen to it subjectively. And those are all for what I would call near field type environments, right? We're just talking about the acoustic transmission. If we start looking at modern day transmission paths and channels through a modern device, a network that has noise suppression, built-in echo cancers, et cetera, mobile telephony, one of the limitations is that we're using that MLS sequence. And it looks, while the spectrum looks a little bit like real speech, the noise signature does, or the, um, excuse me, the time domain does look a lot like noise. And so we could run into issues where we just cannot use it on modern day communication devices, unfortunately. And that's where there's a little bit of a gap currently with those algorithms. Now, a quick detour here. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time. I just want to mention that RASTI, Rapid STI, was developed in the late 80s. It was basically akin to the PSIL evolution of, of articulation index, where we just cut down on a lot of the uh, bands that we're looking at to speed up calculation and give us a number quicker back in the day when processing power was at a premium. And back then, we could do the RASTI calculation in 30 seconds, which is very rapid compared to about 15 minutes for the regular STI. Today, doesn't matter. And it's really been superseded by STEPA, which is the speech transmission index specifically for public address systems. I put some notes in there for you guys to consider with STEPA, but in general, it's not something we use too much in communication, uh, telecommunications today. Now, everything we talked about so far was about the analytical and objective approach to using these algorithms. There are also standards, such as ANSI S3.2, that describes the subjective approach for intelligibility testing. And one of the most popular ones is the modified Rhine test. And you may or may not be surprised to hear that there's still quite a few institutions out there that require subjective evaluation of a lot of their products and systems. For instance, the military. They're very keen on having actual real live people sit down and partake and do these studies to gauge the performance. The fundamentals for an MRT, the modified rhyme test, is that we take five talkers and five listeners, we present a uh, word list, so there's 50, uh, not pairs, but groups of words. Each of those groups contains six words, like the one I have here, sun, nun, gun, fun, bun, and run. And then the talker would communicate uh, through the transmission path, through the device that they want to test, usually using a carrier sentence, and would say something like, you will have to mark down sun now. And then the listener will have to obviously mark down what he or she thought they heard, and then some poor person has to collect all those results and make sense of it in the end. So as you can imagine, it's very time consuming. It's very uh, difficult. People get, it's very tedious. People get tired of doing these at the end. But sometimes people want to do this subjectively instead of using the objective metrics. And at least for this case, subjectively with a modified rhyme test, you actually get to hear the real speech and some real human being evaluating the final uh, outcome. Now, the reason for mentioning this is 
that gets us onto the doorstep of mean opinion score metrics. So much like an MRT, modified rhyme test, MOS metrics are fundamentally based on these subjective jury testing where they people are asked to listen to samples of real speech on communication devices and then judge the quality. From all those individual quality assessments, we're able to build up a final result and a model for how we can potentially evaluate it automatically. Those are the MOS metrics, the mean opinion scores. But those are all created and centered around speech quality instead of speech intelligibility. Now, if you look at the little uh, graph here, what we're trying to show here is if you have high speech quality in the right-hand block, you almost by default will have high speech intelligibility. But if you have high speech intelligibility, there is absolutely no guarantee that you have high speech quality. So it's a little bit of a one-way street as opposed to a two-way street here, but there is a strong link between the two. And that speech intelligibility is one of the key components to high speech quality. If you think about early artificial intelligence or early computer genera uh, generated voice, it sounded incredibly robotic. Uh, it sounded incredibly monotonous. You were able to perfectly understand what those voices were saying, but it did not sound very natural or very human-like. Right, so there wasn't a particularly high quality. You might have to focus a little bit because it was so robotic, but you could certainly understand it. That's one of the key differences. And not to get too far into the, the pool of speech quality, but to give you a sense of what rolls into that, intelligibility is just one element of that. There's also plenty more, such as listening effort that's a part of speech quality as well as naturalness and quality things like that for that we have a completely separate webinar this year it's scheduled for may 1st we hope if you guys have an interest in this that you will join us then so let's not cover that now it's just to show you there is a link between the two and there'll be much more later on now let's wrap this thing up because the messages that we have tried to convey to you today is that there are many intelligibility metrics available. However, they in some cases use a certain source signal like the modified MLS. In most cases, they just look at the noise environment. And for many situations, all of them, basically the index value that you get does not reflect the human intelligibility. There's still some uh, correction or weighting curve that you have to apply in order to get the fin final human intelligibility. But while MOS metrics are very cool and can accomplish a lot, they aren't the end all and be all of voice quality analysis and telecommunications analysis. The Speech intelligibility metrics actually are a very important tool in our toolbox, and there are some applications out there that do serve us very well. I did want to just touch on the speech quality aspect, but not too much other than to say that there was a link between the two. And I guess one of the things that we didn't touch on too much here, but is worth mentioning in this context, is that if you look at the speech intelligibility uh, metrics available to us now, none of them use real speech for evaluating real speech intelligibility, ironically. Whereas if you look at the quality metrics, a lot of them maybe reach a too high, too high of a benchmark. And with a lot of industries now actually going towards measuring things like e-call, right? Emergency call features in a vehicle or first responder services. If you look at those situations, you're not quite concerned with fundamental intelligibility. I think we've solved that. 
but you're not necessarily looking to evaluate the speech quality with a Polka or a three quest type of metric. You're looking for something in between. And that's where something like a listening effort metric could fit in. One of the driving forces there is the ITU right now, where the eCall standards, for instance, is pushing heavily at adopting a new and different metrics for evaluating the speech intelligibility, or rather the amount of effort it takes to understand somebody in that situation. Because if you imagine yourself to be in a car accident, the fundamental of, of, of e-call testing is that on board your vehicle, there's a separate black box device with its own modem, speaker, and mic that'll survive the crash, make a call to a first responder that allows you to communicate with that person. But if you are in an accident, you're most likely distressed, uh, hopped up on adrenaline and endorphins, and you may be injured, and you may have somebody else in the vehicle that you're concerned about. You're not necessarily going to follow the normal uh, com uh, convention of conversation. You're just trying to get the message out. And in that case, you likewise aren't too concerned about what the first responder's speech quality is like. You're more concerned with, did I understand that message without having to focus too hard or pay too much of attention, without too much listening effort, but still get the underlying message of, Maybe I need to administer CPR. Maybe I need to do something else. Maybe I need to switch on the hazards. There's a lot of things, a lot of messages that could be communicated in that scenario where we're really just more concerned with intelligibility. And that's where something where listening effort metric does fit in, in between the fundamental intelligibility and in between the high-end speech quality, but something that actually uses real speech. And for that, I would encourage you to look at ITUT P1140. And keep up with the ITU standards because I think those are probably the ones that will be the driving force behind getting a new metric out that actually addresses this issue. And I will say there are other applications, things like uh, in-car communication, where the big three-row vehicles use the in-vehicle audio systems for transmitting voice from the front row to the back row in such a way that there's no weird delays, echo, stereo effects relative to the acoustic path. And for that, we're not necessarily with, interested in getting a high, let's say, polka score. We're interested in something maybe a little bit more akin to listening effort not being too high. So there's a lot of use cases for something like a listening effort metric. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attendance. Uh, I would like to invite you to join us next week as we dive into and peel back another layer of the onion on the drive into telecommunications metrics. Next week is basic voice quality metrics. It'll be a good one, and we look forward to having you there. Thank you very much.